October the 10th is World Mental Health Day, and this year's theme is focused on how we prioritize mental health in the workplace. That's because employed adults spend more time working than any other activity. But for too many people, work falls short of its potential to provide us with a sense of meaning and purpose. A combination of high workloads, long hours, and unhelpful coping strategies means that we can quite easily find ourselves living to work with a human, health, and economic impact that's measured in billions of pounds each year. With that in mind, in this video, I'm gonna break down the true cost of mental illness in the workplace, including how it's measured and the business case for senior leaders to make it a priority. The adverse effects of mental ill health on economic activity are well documented. In March of this year, a paper published by the Center for Mental Health provided us with an updated view of the economic and social costs of mental ill health in England, which when adjusted for inflation, macroeconomic and large scale trends has been calculated to be nearly 110 billion pounds each year. In descending order, this is broken down by staff turnover, presenteeism, economic inactivity, and sickness absence. Mental health related staff turnover is when employees leave and are replaced in a workforce due to mental health related issues. This could include long hours, increased stress, or lack of job security. It's calculated by first taking the number of people who voluntarily resign due to mental health expressed as a percentage of the entire workforce, which according to figures published by the CIPD and Deloitte comes to just over two and a half million. This is then multiplied by the individual cost of staff turnover over, which is calculated to be 62.5% of an average salary, which in and of itself is adjusted for reduced earnings attributed to poor mental health. By multiplying these two numbers together, you get a cost of staff turnover attributed to mental health of £43 billion. The second category of economic cost is presenteeism, which is defined as attending work in spite of illness. It's characterized by lower productivity, more mistakes, and ultimately putting more hours in for less output, according to the 2023 edition of Britain's Healthiest Workplace, which is the UK's largest employee wellbeing survey. Employees lost 20% of working hours due to presenteeism, which represents a loss of 49.7 productive days per employee per year. To calculate the economic cost of this, 46%, or in this case 22.8 days, are presumed to be related to mental ill health. This number is multiplied by the number of people in the workforce and multiplied again by the economic cost of a lost productive day, which based on the net daily wage of a worker on the median UK salary is estimated to be £72.50. Giving us a final cost of presenteeism associated with mental ill health in England of £42 billion. Next up, we have the cost of economic inactivity. To be considered economically inactive, a person of working age must not be in employment, must not have sought work within the previous four weeks, and be unable to start work in the next two weeks. The initial step of this calculation includes the number of people who are economically inactive because of long-term sickness where mental health was a factor. These figures were then adjusted to reflect instances where mental health was the main reason. This was then multiplied by a weighted average of working days lost, and that value was in turn multiplied by the cost of a productive day lost to economic inactivity, providing us with a final figure of nine billion pounds. The fourth and final category is the cost of sickness absence from paid employment. The Office for National Statistics estimated that in 2022, sickness absence in the UK labour market amounted to 185 million days. When adjusted to reflect the UK population ratio, 160 million of this was in England. Working with this figure, the number of sick days connected with mental ill health, namely stress, depression and anxiety, is estimated to be around 51%. Multiply this by the economic cost of a lost productive day, based on the average net daily wage and factor in for 13% of the workforce that's self-employed, we arrive at a figure of 6.5 billion pounds lost through sickness absence related to mental health. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how mental illness costs the UK economy 110 billion pounds each year. I've left links in the description to all of the source material should you wish to mull over the figures in your own time. But for now, if you're watching this as a business leader, manager or employee, and you're curious not only as to how these numbers relate to your organization, but more importantly, where you might start if you were going to leverage them to secure investment in your next initiative, you'll be pleased to know that the latest analysis from Deloitte suggests that you can achieve an average return of £4.70 for every £1 spent on employee mental health and wellbeing. In addition, the 2023 Health and Wellbeing at Work report from the CIPD, which bases its analysis on the responses of over 900 organizations and over 6 million employees, suggests that there are at least 15 individual metrics that can be used to evaluate the impact of an organization's wellbeing activity. These metrics were split across the categories of health, employee satisfaction, and organizational measures. At a glance, the survey tells us that sickness absence rates remain the most common metric used. 63% of respondents measure employee engagement levels, 52% measure the take-up of employees 
employee assistance programs, and 29% measure well-being through referral times to occupational health. It also correlates that organizations which take a more rigorous approach to evaluating their health and well-being initiatives are much more likely to report that their activity has resulted in a positive outcome. It also summarizes key themes and recommendations on how to do this, including being able to demonstrate what difference an activity made to employee outcomes, such as attendance, engagement, and performance, predefined approaches to evaluation combined with continuous improvement, the regular use of employee engagement surveys to understand self-reported measures of well-being, and the application of these results to ensure future initiatives continue to meet the needs of your workforce. The following legislation provides yet more reasons why the mental health of your employees should be a priority. For example, the Health and Safety at Work Act of 1974 states that it should be the duty of every employer, so far as is reasonably practicable, to ensure the health, safety, and welfare of all their employees. This includes making sure that the working environment is safe, risk assessments, training, and equipment maintenance. If, for example, an employee is injured at work and they can prove their injury was caused by an employer's negligence, they may be able to make a personal injury claim. What you may not be aware of is that the Act defines personal injury as any disease and any impairment of a person's physical or mental condition. In other words, employers have a legal obligation to treat the mental and physical health of their employees as equally important. Next up, the Equality Act 2010 prevents discrimination against people with a protected characteristic. This includes, but is not limited to, gender, race, religion, and in this case, disability. That's because by law, a person with mental ill health can be considered disabled if their condition has a substantial and adverse effect on their life, has lasted or is expected to last at least 12 months, or it affects their ability to do normal day-to-day -day activities, such as interacting with people, following instructions, and keeping to a set working time. In addition, mental illness can be considered a disability even if all of the symptoms are not present all of the time. If an employee is disabled, an employer must not discriminate against them because of their disability and must make reasonable adjustments, whereby a provision, criterion, or practice of an employer puts a disabled person at a substantial disadvantage in relation or comparison with those who are not disabled to take such steps as is reasonable to have to take to avoid the disadvantage. To build a bigger picture of how legislation is applied, the case law section of the National Archives website is a tool that allows the user to research judgments and decisions in the UK going back to 2003. Simply enter the keywords that relate to your query and filter by court, date range, or person. You can then take your pick from thousands of cases that provide examples of legislation in practice. There's also a link to that website in the description. But in summary, the business case for investing and prioritizing mental health in the workplace is as follows. Your business is likely losing its very own share of 110 billion pounds each year as a direct result of staff turnover, presenteeism, and sickness absence associated with mental illness. You will receive nearly five times the return on investment for every one pound spent on employee mental health and wellbeing initiatives. And in case you missed the last part, you are duty bound by legislation to ensure the safety and welfare of your employees, which includes mental health. In any event, mental health is and should be a priority for everybody, both in and outside of the workplace. And so if you've gotten value from this video and you share my passion for the subject, please share, consider subscribing. And while you're here, check out either of these two videos.